So today I'm going to talk about molecular modeling of the interaction of taxi and with quorum sensing regulator plus R of pseudonymous argonaut. Right now, at this moment, there is a huge problem as the World Health Organization stated that in the coming years, and actually right now due to COVID, we're already facing this problem, the antibiotic resistance problem. The thing is, for example, I mean, many, if you have, if you have had COVID-19, in many cases, I mean, the doctors have assigned antibiotics. And the thing is, if you take into that account, uh, most of the deaths caused by COVID-19 are actually by secondary infection due to bacteria. And the, the, the usage of antibiotics for treating COVID-19, I mean, this also actually affects, uh, increases the rate of antibiotic resistance. So the thing is, as you can see on this slide, actually, the World Health Organization announced the list of the most dangerous superbugs. And among them, as you can see, it's the most arabinosa, and it's the priority category, it belongs to critical. So the thing is, antibiotics are not effective anymore. So how do we solve that problem? And one strategy is to target the quorum sensing system. The thing is, uh, quorum sensing system is like the communication system of the bacteria. Basically, the, the bacteria communicate with each other, uh, release signaling molecules, and that way they control their social behavior. And one of those behaviors is the synthesis, is the creation of biofilms. Uh, think of biofilms as a castle that, that allows them to defend the bacteria from antibiotics. So to give you an idea, is that biofilms increase antibiotic tolerance by a thousand times, and also biofilms are less susceptible to immune response. So you can see that this is a quite a huge problem. And the idea is to use secondary metabolites which are small molecules to target specifically the core sensing system of pseudonymous organos. So the thing is, actually, the core the pseudonymous organos core sensing system consists of three different systems. So here you can see this is the hierarchy of the QS system of pseudonymous organos. And from the slide, you can see that actually the last I, last R system controls the others. So basically, if we inhibit last R system, we can. Uh, we can stop the signaling cascade, which activates the whole core sensing system of the bacteria, those which can lead to the uh, decrease of the synthesis of biofilms, and also uh, make sure that the antibiotics are more effective because it, it decreases, for example, the so called uh, resistance mechanism of the bacteria by, by turning off the core sensing system. So, as you can see, actually, the biofilms, for example, all of the systems. They all lead to the, uh, the synthesis of biofilms. Those target definitely the last R system. And as you can see, there are many other parts which correspond to the biofilm dispersion. Another example, uh, another fact, and that is, for example, uh, by targeting the core sensing system, we can also uh, like uh, affect the biofilm structure. So basically, the bacteria they go to the plant plant planktonic state, and again, they are much more susceptible to antibiotics. So right now I'm going to talk about the structures that were used for our molecular modeling. And the thing is, we have used taxifol, which is a flavonoid. And the thing is, it has been shown for flavonoids that they inhibit this the core sensing system, specifically LASR through a non competent mechanism. They do not act, act via competition. They do not disrupt the dimerization of LASRs. They prevent LASR from binding to promoter DNA. And they also produce a it does not use the canonical binding site. And another paper, they show that there are multiple antagonists that bind to last R, they stabilize it and provoke an unnatural fault. And thus, it does not allow the binding of last R to promoter. And also, this does not, the antagonist does not affect dimerization. So both papers, they suggest the same thing. So that's why we specifically taxifolin is another type of flavonoid. And, and all the results they mostly show for quercetin. So for the materials and methods, as you can see on, this, on the left side, this is the whole past software list that were used for molecular modeling. And this is the sequence alignment that were used for the LASR structure. Okay, so basically, the first thing was to construct the whole uh, structure of the LASR protein. We used a couple of structures. See here the templates, the main templates serve this one, which is the current sensing control repressor. Right now, the question is, uh, the problem is that 
Luster protein, the whole structure is not available. So this part is just like a quick introduction from our previous paper. And after, after the construction, we, uh, we move to the molecular docking. In this case, we performed sort of ensemble docking where we use multiple docking programs and try to use machine learning techniques. For example, we perform molecular docking with multiple docking programs such as RDoc, Flexate, Autodogwin, and Redoc. And then we clusterize the data and we find there are two sites. And the thing is, as I mentioned earlier, that the quercetin, uh, specifically the OH7 group, is responsible for the main inhibitor activity. So that's why they decided to imitate the experiment and modify the OH7 group with a simple hydrogen atom. And in both cases, we can see there are two, uh, two uh, clusters that correspond, that, are, that correspond to all docking programs. And after that, we perform molecular, dyna molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, and as you can see, that the, the structures are quite stable in this case. That uh, we've, uh, we've simulated, we've performed simulations for over like two microseconds in some cases, so we have got enough data. And after that, here you can see, for example, the first binding site is the, is that the LBD binding domain. And using the, for example, the uh, the taxophil molecule does not interact directly in the binding domain, so it's from the last allosteric mechanism, but it does interact through some uh, important um, residues that are quite uh, conservative, conserved in different species. And in this case, just changing, just changing that the oh, without the OH group, it does affect the binding, and those it does interact with, with the it does interact with less and less residues. And in the case of the, uh, the second binding site, which corresponds to the DNA, DNA binding, the, the bridge, as you can see, here's the location. Uh, in, this, in the first situation, the normal textile molecule interests with many residues, certain unnatural residues. As for the just removing the OH group, just uh, decreases the amount of the molecules that participate in the interact. As for the that's also the thing is we've also calculated the relative binding energy to get an idea. Just say just these values, actually this and this are correspond to our previous papers to, to give an idea exactly the binding energy. And as you can see, for example, the quercetin and taxophone, they have almost the same binding energy, but yet they are more than the native OT inducer. The native inducer activates the, the molecule. Uh, so we can use it actually the in the for quercetin and taxifolin for the second bind uh, are not competitive binding mechanisms, but are like uh, more like a non competitive mechanism. They inhibit for non competitive mechanism. So, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Okay. The section is open for questions. Okay, I ask specialists in this field to ask questions. If there are some questions, please ask. No, no questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Investigations of um, dynamical properties of laser with incorporated DBR section under the influence of external optical feedback. And this work is done together with my postgraduate student, and uh, I hope he is present here. And uh, okay, the outline of my talk I investigated setup, motivation, equations, results, feedback sensitivity, bifurcation analysis, and conclusions. A distributed uh, Bragg reflector laser represents a simple realization of semiconductor laser operating in a single longitudinal mode. Naturally, they operate at wavelengths close to the maximum of DBR reflectivity, and the presence of DBR causes a renormalization of parameters, photon lifetime, alpha factor, coupling rate, and feedback phase in the Lankobayashi equation for semiconductor laser subject to uh, external optical um, <clears throat> feedback. A well-established formula for estimating the feedback tolerance is modeled for the tuning DBR laser. And <clears throat> for the first time, we did a bifurcation analysis of Lanko-Bayashi equation, um, which confirms the modified uh, formula. Um, here, 
I show the <coughs> um, laser itself. A distributed Bragg reflector is here, with uh, is connected with active region and uh, <coughs> such uh, device are operating naturally at wavelengths close to the maximum of DBR reflectivity, where the threshold is minimal. We placed a mirror at the distance uh, L, around 60 centimeters from the front facet of the laser. Lambda L is the emission wavelength of the solitary laser, and <coughs> uh, phi is the external phase, and R is the reflectivity of uh, this uh, mirror. Here I included the parameters, okay, they will appear in the uh, paper, all these uh, parameters, and uh, <coughs> you see the reflectivity spectrum of DBR section, which is this line, and if you see for um, <coughs> different lengths, uh, we have some accessible tuning range, which is limited by this um, uh, range in the case of uh, one millimeter or uh, 0 0.5 millimeter one millimeter and three millimeter um, <clears throat> so solid magnet as i said is a reflectivity of dbr section and it, it has the following uh, formula and um, <clears throat> the dotted threshold is uh, given the uh, gain with given laser frequency omega L. Okay, next one. Uh, we present a so far missing theoretical study how DBR laser reflection tolerance depends on the detuning between laser wavelengths and maximum of DBR reflectivity. We found that uh, such uh, a treatment not, uh, it is not presented in literature and uh, we uh, did such an uh, investigation. It is well known that too strong optical feedback can destabilize the laser, causing unwanted pulsation, uh, multiple atraxus, or coherent collapse, or even chaos. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, can estimate uh, the critical feedback strengths from the well known Helms Hederman formula, which is here, and the relaxation with oscillation becomes undated. At this uh, threshold, the left hind um, side of um, this formula is the effective feedback rate with the power reflectivity R, which is here, and we can obtain easily analytically the formula for um, reflectivity of feedback R beyond uh, which instability uh, occurs. And uh, good for weak feedback, no DBR parameters enters in this formula. We uh, look for Lankobayashi equation, which is presented here. Only the difference with many, many of papers which were presented before us is that this parameter, alpha, tau, t, eta, on phi, they are constant. In our case, all these parameters, they are not any more constant, but they depend on, <coughs> uh, assuming that the detuning, DBR laser with feedback is also described by these equations. Now, we consider the extra including of detuning, which is here, and uh, we look for ex external cavity modes, and um, we introduce the stationary value for omega s, and ns have the full value here. Uh, where the following formula represents a renormalization of the coefficients in the lang kobayashi equations. As I said, in our case, all these four uh, parameters, they depend uh, on the detuning. And here we obtain the <coughs> how uh, these, par these parameters depend on the detuning. And here are the values for these parameters. The influence of break reflector is considered in this um, uh, uh, parameter tau uh, uh, with kappa. Uh, if tau kappa is equal to zero, one can easily obtain exactly the when no coefficients for a fabri perot laser with lens LR, because these formula are well known before uh, we uh, publish this uh, paper, our paper. Now let's look how <coughs> these parameters uh, depends on the detuning, on the detuning. And you see here that for um, uh, um, constant detuning, the value of alpha is equal 1.2. This is a dotted line. When 
we change the length of the active region, the length of uh, the alpha factor, it uh, depends on the detuning. And it strongly depends on the negative detuning, which is shown here. The value uh, goes from 1.2 up to 7. Next parameter is tau p, photon lifetime, and <clears throat> it also depends on the detuning and also on the length of the active region. And eta, which is um, feedback strength, depends strongly on this uh, detuning. And um, <clears throat> uh, just to mention that the dotted lines are for all now Fabry Perot lasers. Okay, we look for the stationary states, which are, as I mentioned, are called external cavity modes. We consider perturbant field and um, <clears throat> we insert ansatz into the Lang Kobayashi equation. And uh, this one uh, goes to first order amplitude equations. The equation, we uh, solve these uh, equations only. We can consider, uh, we introduce a new phase, which includes the external phase and other changes of the phase due to the reflection. And um, uh, we uh, look for non trivial solution require vanishing of the system of determinant of this matrix. And um, we found that uh, for zero detuning, we got these uh, two uh, station, uh, stations here. Next, we look for <coughs> the stability analysis. And um, this is very important when your, your laser is operating, you have to know in which regime it is operating. And here is uh, by yellow, we see uh, this uh, calculation was done by a program which we have uh, here at the Technical University, DDBF tool. And uh, we got the yellow regions, this is a stable modes. Uh, the green is unstable. This means we will have some periodical solution, period doubling, or even chaos here in this green region. And also, we have some region where the antimods are uh, present. Antimods, uh, this means uh, that there is, you cannot see on your screen anything. Only you will see this uh, region uh, even stable or unstable uh, region. Um, here in this figure, we look for the influence of the tuning on the stability limits, and um, we compare the dotted and solid line from bifurcation analysis, DBF tool of the Lankobayashi uh, equations coefficients, and dash dotted is estimated from this uh, previous formula. And you see that in the range, where um, in, in, in some range, there is a very good agreement between uh, two uh, theories. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we see also that for very long feedback, not 60 centimeter, but 1.8 meter, we have an agreement, uh, very nice agreement be between uh, these theories. Uh, next one is um, we look for the critical feedback reflectivity per parameter different from standard and feedback tolerance we found up to 40% um, uh, have been, uh, which was reported in this paper, recently in this paper. And this one was uh, proved in our calculation. We, we got the same 40% of um, uh, critical feedback reflectivities. And this is uh, a good way that um, our um, uh, simulations are uh, almost close to what uh, was uh, obtained in the experiment. We also look for the stability uh, analysis of uh, stationary states, and um, we um, presented here stable external cavity modes um, by green line, unstable external cavity modes by, um, uh, by uh, blue, and also we show here the saddle node bifurcation, hop bifurcation, and, and uh, so on. Uh, this figure allowed us to, to look for a um, region where the stable mode are uh, present. Uh, next one is to look how the 
um, the stability analysis influences the length of the active region and we learned that um, for 0 0.5 for, uh, 0 .5, uh, millimeter device the region of instability is um, very uh, large and for three millimeter devices the region of instability disappears. And this one is agree with the <clears throat> experiment which uh, was done at the Ferdinand Brown Institute. Um, in conclusion, theoretical study on how the detuning between the lasing reflex and the maximum of the reflectivity of break section influences the tolerance of DBR laser against external reflection is presented. The presence of DBR causes a renormalization of the parameter. Bifurcation analysis um, it shows that for long feedback, um, we can confirm the helms petterman formula. In applying the normalization, we could reach a very large stability border near 1% by drastically reducing the coupling constant. We regard the existence of wide region of instability for negative detuning, and this is done due to the <clears throat> higher values of alpha, par, uh, alpha parameters. There is, uh, these results offer the possibility of reflection tolerant communication with cheap and compact EBR laser. Uh, when I presented the laser uh, from Nature Photonics paper, uh, these lasers are very <clears throat> uh, cost, very higher cost, but our lasers, which soon will be realized at the Ferdinand Brown Institute in Berlin, are very low, uh, have, uh, it's a very low price. I acknowledge the project, uh, uh, my project at the Technical University of Moldova, which is uh, uh, financed by um, uh, ANI City. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Troncio. I hope everyone uh, can uh, hear me. My name is Victoria Pescurte. I'm coming from Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care at uh, Nikolai Testimitsano State University of Medicine and Pharmacy. Uh, by profession, I'm an anesthesiologist, passionate with data science, machine learning, and related fields, and uh, trying to apply the advances in this uh, field to a clinical setting and for continuing the presentation, uh, I will uh, play the pre-recorded video. Meanwhile, I will prepare for eventual question. At the screen and uh, using the latest definition, we can state, uh, making it uh, simple, that uh, this is the situation when the body uh, starts losing the fight with the micro. And some statistics uh, stating that uh, one out of three intensive care patients will present with sepsis. Mortality is quite high and ranges between 15 and 56 percent. And worldwide, sepsis is affecting more than 30 million people with uh, 6 million deaths. Some uh, important uh, medical aspects concerning sepsis. First of all, diagnosis is based on micro identification and confirming uh, this and uh, tracking the conditions of the patient using uh, a number of clinical tools. Uh, on the screen is SOFA, sequential organ failure assessment score that is using a, a number of parameters listed on the screen. Next, the treatment. Uh, the primary importance here is the source control and antibiotics that should be used timely. Uh, time means without a delay and the plot illustrates uh, what means a delay uh, in antibiotic administration uh, with every hour the mortality will increase and uh, exceeding uh, six to five hours with antibiotic treatment uh, can cause uh, a double increase in mortality Summarizing, we can say that uh, available tools uh, are uh, good for confirming the diagnosis, but they are far not appropriate for uh, predicting sepsis. And this research is uh, designed to cover this gap. 
Machine learning is being used for uh, addressing this problem uh, recently and I will uh, describe one of the state-of-the-art systems uh, described in the literature, uh, the inside uh, system. Uh, and at the bottom of the screen you have an article with more details about this. I will uh, show only two diagrams. I would like you to pay attention to the diagram on the right with the uh, performance of different systems. Uh, the upper uh, line, upper curve uh, is for the inside system. The lower one are for the regular tools including a sofa and you can see the difference. Uh, one of the uh, outcomes uh, concerning the use of this system uh, will be 39.5% uh, reduction uh, of in-hospital mortality. Our research uh, uh, uses data coming from uh, a 2019 challenge concerning urosepsis prediction from clinical uh, data uh, that uh, comprises over 40,366 uh, cases uh, coming from two distinct U.S. hospitals, set A and set B, including 40 parameters, vital science, laboratory indices, and others, 1.5 million time windows, and over uh, 10 million data points and because uh, set A uh, contains less missing value uh, it was selected for further processing. Tools used for this research can be grouped as uh, on the screen. First of all, uh, our programming language tool in uh, tools including Shiny package for building web applications, H2O platform for machine learning, all from language for some verification and finally python programming uh, language including the h2o wave a recent package for building uh, practical clinical applications uh, back to the data we can see that there are uh, many parameters present uh, in the uh, data, uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are missing, but about this a little bit later. Now, I would like to mention that we were uh, experimenting with different sets of parameters and selected as parameters with the highest discriminatory value, sepsis versus non-sepsis. Uh, the, the set uh, presented on the screen, including heart rate, oxygen saturation, systolic blood pressure, diastolic pressure, respiratory rate and temperature. Uh, and in fact, the six parameters are routinely available in a modern intensive care unit. Uh, data and missing values. Uh, on the screen, you have uh, an example of a, a subset uh, with a lot of missing values and for addressing this problem we elaborated an algorithm for data reconstruction and you can see the result on the left uh, bottom part of the screen how the reconstructed data looks like. Uh, data representation is an, another important step uh, and in this, our case we uh, are using uh, the Kolmogorov uh, algorithmic complexity calculated by the block decomposition method. I will be speaking um, in details about uh, this approach tomorrow during my presentation in one of the uh, signal processing sessions. Uh, now I will focus only on data engineering aspects, uh, original da data to uh, be passed to the algorithmic complexity calculator need to be reshaped uh, in three by three matrices uh, and such a matrix uh, encodes the condition of a certain body system, in this case circulatory system, where rows are for parameters and uh, columns for parameter uh, values in uh, consecutive samples. Uh, these uh, matrices are binarized using uh, as a threshold uh, value the mean value per row and uh, later one uh, we are calculating the algorithmic complexity and also adding to the uh, final vector that is passed to uh, the machine learning algorithm the difference 
of the respective parameters value between two consecutive hours and at the bottom of the screen you can see how uh, the final set of the data uh, looks like with the first column for uh, the uh, sample labeling zero for non-sepsis and one for sepsis next to columns for uh, the uh, algorithmic complexity and v1 to v12 uh, uh, columns for the difference of the six parameters during three hours uh, next step will uh, consist on uh, splitting the data into the training and test set. For this, we are using three pod and ProBust uh, principles uh, that will let us uh, later one to perform uh, tenfold cross validation during the machine learning phase. And in this way, the final set for machine learning uh, will consist uh, of, of the trading set including uh, 5157 samples and the test set uh, that comprises 909 samples and uh, this the same set uh, is passed to four uh, machine learning algorithms, namely generalized linear model, gradient boosting machine, distributed random forest, and neural network as multi-layer perceptron. On the screen, you can see the comparative performance of four algorithms by area under the curve, and the lower performance is shown by the linear model, and the higher is one by the gradient boosting machine. And in this table, you can see a more detailed information concerning the uh, performance metrics. And once again, the GBM uh, is the uh, best. And I would like to mention that uh, from the very beginning, we have replicated in our language the inside uh, system, uh, originally built in uh, Python uh, language, and used uh, this uh, replica as a benchmark while uh, uh, researching. Uh, our uh, own system as you can see the performance it is quite uh, similar uh, except recall that is two percent higher in uh, our system and specificity that is two percent lower uh, for our system and now i would like to uh, uh, switch to um, demo application that exemplifies uh, most of the aspects that I uh, have presented so far. And here on the center of the screen, we have an Excel-like uh, uh, table, just a moment, uh, where we, uh, the doctor or the nurse can input the parameter value, for instance, heart rate 78, uh, saturation 97, temperature 38, uh, systolic blood pressure 115 millimeters of mercury, diastolic 76, respiratory uh, 24, and uh, collecting uh, three such uh, observations of all, uh, six uh, parameters value, or we uh, are able to ask the system to perform the prognosis. Uh, what else we can do with this application? Uh, here we have a list of pre-selected cases and I will be using one of them. We can uh, display the patient data as a table with uh, columns for respective parameter and uh, rows for uh, all the observation we can also visualize this data as plots we can see that our patient is for the seven hours uh, in the intensive care unit and finally we can uh, get the prognosis for the last observation which in uh, this case uh, is uh, uh, high risk sepsis uh, prediction uh, we also can um, look at the dynamics of the sepsis risk during the patient's stay. Uh, for this, uh, we need to uh, perform the uh, respective calculation and finally we can plot it. Uh, we can uh, notice that uh, at the very beginning the risk was uh, low, zero risk, and uh, in one hour from the admission the risk uh, be become uh, high and it also means uh, that uh, we need uh, to start antibiotics and it also means that only in four hours the regular clinical tools will be able to confirm the diagnosis.
okay uh in fact uh that's all about my presentation and uh, maybe there are questions concerning the presentation any questions no questions thank you professor Yapuskurto, for interesting presentation Uh, I present here, uh, as you said already, the National Research Nuclear University, uh, MIFI, and I am head of uh, laboratory special microelectronics. And um, first of all, I'd like to maybe uh, tell some words about our team, about our uh, main uh, research direction and a little bit uh, therefore uh, on this slide you can see the first our uh, research and development direction uh, it's uh, computer aided design on special uh, micro scheme it's maybe our the main uh, direction of our investigation and design and here you can see uh, a simple uh, example of same work. work it's a chipset for CPM matrix, especially for medical. Uh, these devices are designed especially for medical uh, application. Uh, our second direction is uh, the methods and devices for distance detection of alpha reactivity. It's now a very important uh, team because uh, it's you, you can see it's uh, nuclear disaster, military action, and terrorist. And finally, the third direction is uh, connected with uh, investigation of human sensitivity to weak uh, microwave radiation no everybody knows that uh, now the is uh, regulated by national standards of electromagnetic safety but unfortunately there are um, a lot of uh, a lot of different contradictions between between existing standard and new uh, numerous studies show show that uh, even uh, two orders of magnitude uh, lower microwave radiation uh, has a very destabilizing and often dangerous effect on humans on health and physiological and uh, any other uh, parameters of our health and uh, you know that international communicative fields especially of mobile uh, phones as uh, class b cancerogenic cancer uh, gen uh, dangerous. But therefore, maybe ten years ago, we were in flu, uh, we were involved in uh, some interesting, I seen interesting investigation of uh, influence of modern model communication on human uh, cardio activity. And here uh, on this slide, I show the system uh, method and techniques for research of this influence microwave influence on human cardio system it's really a great problem therefore uh, this uh, my report is uh, uh, connected with uh, our new system which we developed oh, one year ago this system uh, so-called the dynamic distributed non-deterministic uh, system 
which allow uh, to measure and mapping the micro wave field levels uh, and uh, simultaneously to report about uh, geographical uh, position of uh, human being. Uh, in this uh, uh, system, a lot of uh, personal terminals record the geographic position is for the GPS uh, using uh, GPS system, uh, uh, GPS blocks, and uh, simultaneously uh, measure the basic parameters of microwave dosimetry, like uh, like density of uh, uh, density of radiation uh, and uh, also the so-called uh, specific adsorption uh, rate and so and so on and this uh, I show the block scheme of this system the main maybe uh, the main uh, part of this system uh, is uh, shown uh, on this picture. It's so-called geodemi mobile terminal. At a, this is a personal device which uh, every uh, volunteer uh, uh, have in all uh, in uh, own using. And um, uh, the, this personal uh, terminal uh, records the geographic position and uh, as well as the basic parameters of uh, microwave design. The data uh, are transferred to a web server uh, where they are stored in the cloud uh, database. Uh, and. Uh, the, after this, then uh, can uh, transfer it to the environmental and medical services of the city, and also can be read uh, on uh, personal uh, memory card of this uh, terminal. And uh, people um, and our software uh, allows to. Uh, to reflect uh, this uh, complex parameters on uh, map of city and also everyone uh, who has this device and personal using uh, can uh, see uh, own uh, road uh, during day road and also uh, uh, according uh, on this uh, road, on this track, you can see uh, in uh, color uh, point, you uh, can see uh, all adsorption uh, dose of uh, electromagnetic energy. Therefore, uh, therefore, just a moment. Now, we used here the new input, uh, the new uh, idea to measure uh, the portal uh, detectors for uh, a measure of uh, uh, microwave uh, falling, en falling uh, energy flux. Uh, and therefore, uh, I, I guess it's very interesting idea to to create uh, portable uh, devices for these purposes. Here you can see uh, our test uh, two prototype of uh, these terminals and uh, we used for um, uh, testing, for measuring uh, uh, this road in the southern districts of the Moscow, you can see, for example, several uh, checkpoints where uh, simultaneously you can see as intensity, dose, 
and also the point, uh, geographical point of the uh, of the volunteers, and uh, maybe uh, uh, yeah, uh, Nasser says that uh, the system uh, indication is is been is uh, based on the Russian standard of safety, and. Uh, this you can also the, the specific parameters of, of this uh, Russian standard. And uh, here you also, it's same uh, picture, but maybe photos with different points of for testing for measuring. Now we are going to make uh, full uh, Megapolis uh, system, which will uh, show the map of the uh, electromagnetic uh, situation in the city, and uh, also um, the best good idea to uh, uh, to make a relation between. Uh, our uh, maps, maps of uh, situation, uh, electromagnetic situation, with uh, digital map of uh, distribution, disease distri distribution in the city. And of course, it's a future idea to uh, understand how uh, modern uh, existing and unfortunately growing, constantly growing electromagnetic contamination uh, is, is a, a effect on epidemiological uh, situation in city in in any districts of the city. This may be uh, best future idea, especially in our <laughs> bad corona's uh, time and so on and uh, so this is my short conclusion that uh, now we uh, designed and tested uh, the prototype of this uh, city systems uh, which can really uh, estimate estimate the uh, electro, uh, electromagnetic contamination in the city, uh, different uh, regions and territories. Uh, and really, we hope this system can serve, serve as, uh, as a source of information and used be used for medicine and biological uh, research of my microwave radiation effects on people, health, physiological uh, states, and so on. Well, thank you for attention. I am ready to answer your questions. Okay, thank you for interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I ask a um, colleague if there are some questions to report. No questions, I have one question. Please, uh, said uh, if you know about the inoffensive distance of placing of construction of the antenna from the building, for example. No, uh, my personal uh, opinion that uh, unfortunately now it's very great uh, danger situation for all citizens uh, in our towns before, but unfortunately, I see, I guess that uh, we don't now uh, enough uh, attention uh, to for 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 this dangerous situation. Therefore, uh, I I guess it's maybe 
in future it will be uh, very strong and uh, it's really urgent uh, problem for everyone. Now it's it's really for, for me it's there for all antennas. It's sources of uh, dangerous radiation. But but I'd like to tell that uh, our investigation, our research, shown that there are very strong individual sensitivity of uh, personal uh, human being to uh, this uh, dangerous uh, danger. Uh, therefore, no, it's my opinion necessary to pay more and more attention on this growing danger for 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 us. For example, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, increase of our immunity, it's a great problem. Really. Okay, thank you. But individual sensibility is for all kinds of radiation, I, I, I suppose. It's not only for radiation. Yeah, for yeah. The spectral yeah. One. Okay. Any question, please? No question. Thank you again for your presentation. Uh, so I will do a presentation on behalf of my team. Um, we are working at the Institute for, uh, of Inorganic Chemistry and Electrochemistry of Tbilisi State University. And um, thank you. Um, I will um, um, thank Dr. Gia for this opportunity. Well, our presentation is about sorbents obtained from cellulose containing waste for water purification. We all know that environmental pollution by industrial emissions is currently really emerging a problem all around the world. And significant part of the wastewater of various origins enters the environment without treatment. Um, and of course, it will negatively affect human health, the environment and the economy itself. Large amounts of heavy metals like lead, cadmium, arsenic, chromium, copper, nickel, cobalt, zinc, and others uh, that generally are presented in wastewater can be caused uh, by waste accumulation and uh, by increased human activity or industrial accidents and can cause various diseases. So what was being offered by us? So among different physicochemical methods of detoxification, adsorption stands out and well, it's considered as universal process uh, to completely remove these toxic impurities. And um, actually, the solution of practical problem is determined by the choice of the sorbents. Uh, and uh, there is important to choose the optimal physiochemical properties and cause. So the purpose of our work was uh, to study the sorption properties of carbon materials, um, carbonaceous materials obtained from secondary raw uh, waste. It was hazelnut and walnut shells. And uh, that was prepared by the technology uh, we, um, we proceed and we have here at the institution. Uh, and um, was developed the technology uh, which um, allows us to obtain carbon materials with a high surface area. Actually, we have already tried this technology and used for many types of raw materials. It was used tires, hazelnut, walnut shells, nectarine kernel, sawdust, plastic, etc. But um, for this presentation, we choose to concentrate only on hazelnut and walnut shells and present our findings. Uh, and uh, so just to show you um, uh, the reactor vessels uh, that have been uh, in hand developed by um, our team members at the institution. So the first one on the right corner uh, was the lab model. Um, it was the first model we have de developed here. And um, uh, the uh, furnace, stainless steel furnace, which is shown on the left corner it's actually the furnace we are using nowadays and it also acts as a catalyst so the process of uh, this um, uh, technology is one stage and what is uh, good about it it doesn't require preliminary processing of raw materials so using this technology 
carbon materials can be um, obtained from recycled organic waste uh, and the process and uh, the outcomes are really cheap, efficient and not time consuming. So to show uh, in this um, presentation slide is depicted um, actually uh, the um, um, a scanning electron, uh, the uh, pictures that were uh, developed by scanning electron microscopes, same. Uh, so those are uh, walnut shells, uh, hazelnut shells, and are uh, compared with a well-known commercially available activated carbon bow. Uh, well, uh, it's mostly known um, with Russian name like Birozov activated on and uh, birch, uh, birch charcoal, uh, uh, birch charcoal activated carbon. So you can see that it's quite uh, porous um, uh, versus uh, activated carbon. Uh, carbon. So uh, what we can see here uh, when um, talking about physical and chemical properties of obtained uh, carbon materials. So those um, measures were uh, being uh, done by bed surface areas and volumes uh, and uh, uh, been measured microfors uh, and was used um, capillary nitrogen con uh, condensation and chemical composition on a scanning electron microscope and been um, uh, evaluated ash content. And of course, uh, here as well, we had uh, uh, for comparison, uh, commercially activated carbon. So we can see that, of course, the commercially obtained carbon has better surface area, but not that much uh, uh, difference in microphores. And uh, actually, it's quite comparable with that one that's uh, nowadays are, uh, commercially uh, in practice. So to go more in detail about the uh, particle, si um, particle size and function of, of reaction temperature, reaction time, and reaction velocity, so it was quite logically uh, comprehended and um, compared. So high reaction temperature causes high nitrogen surface area uh, that cause shorter reaction time and high rate um, nitrogen surface area. So here are uh, depicted um, uh, pictures that shows um, how it uh, corresponds and how it, uh, how it correlates. Um, we also measured uh, the um, physical and uh, chemical properties of uh, obtained um, carbon materials um, with uh, the composition. So, and to com also we, um, of course, compared them uh, with the commercially available uh, one. Uh, the um, analysis and chemical composition were measured by Brucker and Quantax and uh, uh, um, of course, uh, so um, the commercial activated carbon were used. So here are shown all the uh, composition that were found in our um, samples and uh, compared with activated carbon. Uh, we also presented uh, our uh, team, our infrastructure, technopark, uh, working environment. So here are uh, shown sky ray uh, spectrometer, uh, micrometric, Gemini 7, uh, Hitachi, uh, Perkin Elmer. So those are our equipment and um, our measures uh, being done by our uh, infrastructure. So, um, and the most important thing, so we decided to concentrate our interest or for uh, really important heavy metals. Uh, they generally are presented in wastewater uh, and um, uh, tasted them for uh, absorption capacity. So you can uh, see on the table uh, degrees of extraction and absorption capacity. So you can actually see that uh, lead has the better absorption capacity compared to cobalt. So cobalt is the is the less uh, successful one. Uh, the uh, measure was done uh, by mixed 
uh, model solution. So they all were presented in solution. Uh, the temperature of solution were 25, 27 degrees centigrade. And uh, the absorption time was about 30, 45 minutes. Uh, actually, for lead, it was much less um, enough, like 5, 10 minutes were enough. As results of time shown uh, in the table, so parameters, uh, um, parameters characterizing uh, the absorption by this adsorbent are approximately the same, actually. Uh, but due, this is due to the fact that the molecules of substance dissolving in water uh, decompose into ions, which are uh, in a hydrate state. In this case, the solute is um, adsorbed on the surface of adsorbent in the form of hydrated ions. And therefore, for a given metal, hydrated ions are adsorbed in the same way on different adsorbents. Uh, so what was found and what are the main outcomes of our research that actually it's uh, depicted in so-called uh, uh, Leotropic series or Hofmeister series. So the ions of heavy metals that were used at adsorptives can be arranged in the following row, like uh, adsorption value for the lead, uh, the better, and for the cobalt is uh, less. And correspondingly, it um, correlates with the radius, ionic radius of these metals. So the uh, bigger radius was uh, for the lead and the smaller radius for uh, cobalt. Uh, and in this case, well, uh, absorption capacity, well, uh, for lead is the maximum in this case, and for the uh, cobalt ions is, uh, is minimum. So to come to conclusion, uh, it was found that the nature of absorption by these adsorbents are the same. Actually, for given metal, hydrated ions are adsorbed in the same way on different adsorbents. But the larger the crystal radius of an ion with the same charge, the better it's adsorbed. Uh, so, um, as we have already um, said, the absorption capacity of lead was better in these uh, parameters. We uh, done and uh, the minimum was copper. Uh, it has to be uh, mentioned that um, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, pH uh, for the um, uh, for the solution that we used as a model solution. Uh, so the best results for all four um, uh, heavy metals were in the range of three five. Uh, for copper, lead, and um, iron ions, cobalt required more acidic, um, uh, acidic area. Uh, so uh, this is um, our work. We uh, consider to continue it and uh, to develop and to, to see what else we can offer uh, to, uh, for the purification of real sample wastewaters. So it was mixed uh, of model of model solutions. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Leila. Any questions, please? I have two questions. With okay. your permission. First question is uh, regarding if uh, your carbon is sorbent from uh, organic waste is good for uh, use in pharmaceutical purposes, for example. Okay, we are um, at this moment testing uh, the um, model solutions and are trying to see as uh, good the sorbents will work. So we have model solutions for the um, persistent pharmaceutical uh, uh, components that is really emerging nowadays. And we will see, we are going to test this in the um, real, uh, real wastewater as well. Um, at this moment, we just started to uh, do this, and um, I can already say that it shows quite um, quite good um, outcomes. And we will we are working in that direction. Thank you. Okay. And the second question, maybe it is a specific questions, but uh, I would like to to know if you test, for example. Uh, Obtain sorbent for decontamination from uh, liquid radionuclide, for example. 
Okay. Uh, so in the institutions, they have been done such kind of works. Yes. And the institution has publications in the field and um, not only radionuclides uh, can be said that uh, our um, our method been applied for the infectious diseases one of the clinics here in georgia applied the sorption system in their discharge uh, sewage um, and uh, it worked well so the sorbents are working uh, as for uh, radioactive um, uh, contamination as for infectious Diseases, but more work are required actually. Okay. But at this Thank moment, you. it's really um, promising. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks Any a lot. Questions? No questions. Okay. Thank you again for your very, very interesting information, especially for Thank me. Thank you. Dear colleague. The study referred to the interference of nanotechnology and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. But uh, what are the tangents of these two areas? At present time, the nanotechnology has demonstrated performance in top technology for 50, 60s of the 20th century, such as nuclear, cosmic, and other fields. The crucial point for nanotechnology development took place in 2000 year with the adoption by the United States of the National Nanotechnology Initiative, followed by the similar programs or strategy in the European Union member states, in the Russian Federation, in China, etc. An important fact of approved National Nanotechnology Initiative is that it is defined nanotechnology as a new state of manifestation of matter, with property very different from the same macrostructure. Nanotechnology are considered now one of the four pillars together with biotechnology, technology of new materials and advanced digital production technology of the post-industrial revolution. Unfortunately, like any cutting edge technology, it can also lead to the development of new destructive technology, especially of weapon of mass destruction. Therefore, risk assessment of nanotechnology become critical in the context of dual use technology. Analyzing the expected uh, risk from the contribution of nanotechnology in various fields, we reiterate some of them. See you on slide four. Thus, in the potential field, the consequence can be extremely varied because different entities with different cultural, political, religious, security dom. The consequence on environment do not require much comment because the diversification of the uncontrolled discharge of particles on the size of molecule or atom can lead to the serious consequences on biotic fauna difficult to predict at present. If you refer to the consequences on human, on biotic in general, you must keep in mind that the toxicity of nanoparticles cannot be directly derived from the property of the some bulk material. Referring to security, the new generation of supercomputer Extensive monitoring of people based on nanosensors are obviously beneficial in the fight against terrorism. But this technology limits human rights and can also be used to suppress the mass action of people. Nanotechnology in the military sector, it is enough to analyze the perspective of the development of automated systems, robotic with auto-replication, which will cause an eventual confrontation of people with a new generation of artificial intelligence. From the above, it is obvious that nanotechnology today has the role of trigger in triggering the new way of existing a new opportunity. The challenge is so great that it is hard to imagine what awaits us on the horizon. In this context, you remember the god Janus, god of door, with the duality of the reality that awaits us when we pass through the door. The large-scale hostile use of nanotechnology is comparable to the benefits expected by society. If you analyze the perspective of the development of nanotechnology in various directions, you see that uh, as practically at all stage of the manufacturing process, the results obtained can be useful in the development of weapons of mass destruction. You know the same in the analysis of the product development process already. 
which has different stage as biochemical system developed based on biochemical sensor, on biochemical energy sources, on biochemical membranes, viruses with certain property and destination. The availability of nanotechnology is already shown for the nuclear weapon of mass destruction, but uh, it is becoming faster and more widespread than nuclear proliferation. When talking about the development of biological or chemical weapon of mass destruction, it is necessary to mention as example following. Nanoparticles are characterized as much, much more reactive compared to biological and chemical agents. Thanks to nanotechnology, the required quantities for the production and delivery of chemical and biological agents will be much smaller. So generating small production facility that are very difficult to detect by existing methods in present. The effect of the new materials at the nanoscale are much stronger because it increases the interaction area, which makes them more toxic and viral. The convergence of nanotechnology with chemical and biological technology create unique premises, such as for editing new molecule of bacteria, thus creating new species or new chemical with targeted properties. New methods of targeted delivery of nanotoxin make them virtually invisible to medical diagnostic and countermeasure. What are the threats coming from nanotechnology regarding development of weapon of mass destruction? Extension or dissemination of nanotechnology due to easy access to information sources through soft technology. Accessibility and acceptable price of nanotechnology attracting more and more state to develop their own weapon of mass destruction. The temptation of state actor to develop their own weapon of mass destruction, initially for defensive purposes, is to discourage potential aggressors. Nanotechnology makes these products substantially cheaper, as well as making them less visible, so they are easy to transport. Thus, they became more accessible to non-state actors who are less influenced by state or international non-proliferation regulation. It is now clear that nanotechnology are dual use, though some regulation are necessary and inevitable in the future. What is the research medicine relation? You know that the medical research is intended to promote human health at the individual and population level through the set of ethical principles set out in the Helsinki Declaration. It is clear that in the field of health, inaction can cause the same harm action. On the one hand, research contributes to innovation in new medicine, vaccine, diagnostic and treatment, which are key components of public health intervention strategy. So, tightening the regulation of life sciences research may result in higher barrier and cost for research and pathogens. The promotion of dual-use product also increases the possibility of malicious use by providing informational material that will help state or non-state malicious actor to develop agents for a biological attack. On the other hand, the modification of or creation of pathogen requires the implementation of responsibility not only for biosafety, but also for biosecurity. The relation chain continues after the dissemination or publication of information being impossible to limit access to information. For these reasons, discussion on the risk and benefits of dual use start later. Ideally, discussion on dual use risk should take place before, not after the research. So, it is difficult to predict the usefulness of new technology for malicious application. Let's analyze some threats that came from the application of nanotechnology in medicine. Medical implant. Medical implant and other digital medical devices can become targets of misuse. The sign of this trend are already noticeable. So in August 2017, the United States Food and Drug Administration issued a safety statement on the potential cybersecurity vulnerabilities of several pacemakers. This vulnerability includes the risk of intentional using the device to discharge its battery or to introduce malicious programming commands into the device. Because the device 
at risk has been implanted on about half million patients. Cybersecurity concerning are not only due to the severity of the case, but also to the possible magnitude. Similar vulnerabilities have been identified in drug infusion pump, brain implant, such as deep brain stimulation, non-invasive brain computer interface. As an example, neurobiology is worrying the possible use of neurotechnology for military purposes, aggression or defense in international and domestic conflict. For these reasons, the three main areas in which ethical questions arise have been identified as the use of neural devices in interrogation, the involvement of military personnel in the research process, and the neurotechnology developed for therapeutic application but used for military purposes. But what is the role of the researcher, the engineer in the field of research and innovation in non-proliferation with nanotechnology and nanoengineering? Researchers are the most knowledgeable and best placed professionally to assess the nature and seriousness of the potential for misuse of knowledge, products, or technology. So, they should be responsible for evaluating and reporting this funding to the research institution or national regulatory bodies. But this goal is rarely put in the front of them by the condition of funding research projects. Research has been and is vulnerable to abusive, unethical application for research result because they generate and provide knowledge, materials, methods, and technology including in the form of CBRN product. They could be channeled into crime or terrorism. They lead to the general free dissemination of information or useful exchange of information, but also guided by the support of human rights to information access. They does not ensure the awareness of future research in terms of innovation that could represent dual use. Even if free a database for scientific result and innovation their vulnerability is not critically assessed and security measures are exceeded from various reasons. What are the recommendations for minimizing or combating the unwanted proliferation of research innovation results? Conducting self-assessment of research risk during or before research, including by updating regularly the assessment model for high-risk areas. Adjusting safety and security measures to counteract safety risk at any stage of research. Assurance of educational through the elaboration curriculum and introducing at the bachelor's or master's degree discipline on interference of non-proliferation of weapon of mass destruction and nanotechnology and nanoengineering. And let's not forget, let's not underestimate the growing role of information and cybersecurity in non-proliferation and all field and domain. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? If there are. Thank you, Mr. Buzdugan, for your very interesting presentation and uh, uh, look on the nanotechnology, nanotechnologies from another angle, from another corner. It's a very important item, I see. Uh, and questions, please. No question. Thank you again for your uh, attention. I have one question, please. Yeah, please. Um, how do you see, uh, Professor Arthur? Um, it's uh, are required uh, uh, to organize uh, some state uh, uh, such of agencies uh, which will um, giving uh, some uh, like of the uh, permissions for. Uh, producing of nanotechnology research and uh, also industry companies uh, which uh, uh, are uh, preparing uh, nanotechnology uh, material. Yeah, I, I, I think in the future, of course, uh, like of the regulations related to the radioactive uh, researches. Yes. Uh, in radioactive field. At present time, there are no such agency as regulatory body, for example, 
as you said, the nuclear radiological field. But in, in, in the future, I don't know, maybe in 10, 20 years, the necessary to organize such agency uh, will be at the table, obligatory, because uh, the, uh, you know that uh, the perspective of nanotechnology is unimaginable. And the positive and negative uh, action from the utilizing the potential of technology, of database, for example, or uh, different uh, uh, elaborated uh, methods and uh, sensor, for example, uh, will be necessary to regulate through the special uh, law and uh, through the special permission from the regulatory agency. In, in such subject, for example. But in the future, not now, it is too early to, to discuss because many people don't understand the possibility of uh, contribu contribution of nanotechnology and nanoengineering and, and proliferation of uh, different uh, type of weapon of mass destruction. Thank you very much. After 20 years without us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, dear colleagues, I'll be presenting the effects of terahertz radiation on the development of biological organisms one with seeds. Uh, the one stands for the fact that I want to continue uh, with uh, researching in this uh, uh, field. Now, uh, the initial spark or the idea for this study uh, started when I stumbled upon um, an article a few months ago regarding how terahertz radiation can disrupt proteins in living cells uh, without killing them, which is an outstanding finding that uh, uh, at that time contradicted the conventional belief that terahertz radiation uh, is uh, safe. However, what is uh, terahertz radiation in the first place? Well, it's a type of electromagnetic radiation that uh, whose frequency uh, stands between those of microwaves and infrared radiation, which are known uh, mostly for the thermal effects on various materials and organisms. Uh, the image is credit to uh, the Deutsches Zentrum für Luft und Raumfahrt. Uh, the effects of terahertz uh, radiation on various biological organisms, um, mainly uh, in the literature, in the scientific literature, it has been documented that, uh, well, the effects depend on various factors ranging from tissue density to ATP content and to met uh, from metabolism to uh, various macro uh, molecules that are found in the, uh, in, in the cells that are exposed to uh, terahertz. Uh, the effects uh, summarized mainly are uh, on organelles, uh, well, uh, on nuclear plasma, it has been seen that there is not much of an effect, uh, mainly because uh, nuclear plasma seems to be extremely resilient, perhaps because it's a uh, double layer of, um, uh, of uh, phospholipids. Um, more of uh, ribosomal proteins and mRNA, which are very um, which are in a way very reactive, uh, may the nature uh, from the effects of terahertz radiation. Um, unlike other proteins, which may be more stable, but it depends from organism to organism. Uh, vacuoles, lysosomes, perox uh, peroxisomes, and other such uh, vacuoles uh, may leak their contents in the, um, in the cytoplasm of their cells which may compromise their function or even uh, kill them. Uh, moreover, mitochondria uh, are seen to produce more reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species, though not always. It's, uh, as always, it's dependent on uh, the species that is studied. Um, in regards to uh, the main categories of cells that have been studied in the past by other researchers, um, mammalian cells uh, are sometimes affected um, in a positive way, but sometimes their, uh, may, uh, their membranes may either become leaky or the cells might die. Um, in regards to bacteria, for example, um, they are uh, usually uh, they were seen to uh, 
to uh, their growth was seen to be slowed down but uh, not be deadly um it's worth noting that so far um terahertz radiation has been studied on escherichia coli um alone uh, for now uh, on fungi on the other hand uh, it has been seen that terahertz radiation causes growth and on plants uh there are there were only four studies that uh, investigated the effects of terahertz radiation on plants, and it has been seen mainly that uh, growth ensues. However, in uh, paddy rice, it has been also seen that chlorophyll mutation also occurs. Um, the effects of terahertz uh, on wheat seeds. So the methods were, uh, I, uh, we first gathered uh, 600 wheat seeds, which were then divided into multiple batches, uh, which were then further divided into subgroups. The multiple batches, uh, well, there were two batches, one where uh, seeds were, um, were exposed dry, and one where uh, the seeds were exposed after coming to contact with water. Um, uh, then these were um, separated into various uh, uh, subgroups depending on how much they were um, exposed to terahertz radiation. We had samples from uh, zero, which was the control group, to uh, one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and 30 minutes. Uh, no subsequent exposure to terahertz radiation was uh, administered to these seeds after the initial exposure. So when they were growing, they were uh, growing without any uh, influence of uh, any additional terahertz radiation. They were then left to sprout and develop over a period of seven days, during which it was uh, a bit of a hassle and chaotic process, mainly because they didn't quite have the uh, necessary condition uh, conditions in the first place to grow they uh, the laboratory was uh, uh, had the dry air and uh, the water quickly evaporated from uh, the petri dishes that uh, we used to uh, to uh, grow them uh, and as such it took them uh, much longer to sprout during uh, which time some of the seeds might have died and uh, might have uh, in uh, uh, might have affected in a bad way the study. Um, to expose the seeds to terahertz radiation, uh, the spectroscope uh, TerraView TPS uh, Spectra 3000, uh, which has an optical tunable uh, titanium sapphire ultra short pulsed laser with the description uh, regarded there. Um, Effect, uh, the effects on of uh, terahertz radiation on wheat seeds, uh, the results were uh, were mixed in uh, in the sense that uh, terahertz uh, as seen in our data may lead to less sprouting overall, but that might be because of the conditions of the laboratory and not necessarily terahertz itself. Moreover. Um, uh, the seeds that do sprout uh, usually grow up uh, more quickly than their counter counterparts. However, a general trend uh, that was seen was the fact that the dry ones uh, seem to have been more affected by terahertz, both in terms of percentage of germination uh, success, which was lower than uh, in the case of uh, wet seeds, as well as speed of growth, which was increased uh, when compared to wet seeds. As such, water may act as a shield uh, um, against terahertz radiation in the sense that it doesn't uh, allow a terahertz radiation to be uh, properly absorbed by the seeds, uh, uh, which may not lead to the changes that were seen in the dry ones. Um, mechanism of action is uh, still yet uh, uh, unknown even though uh, there have been multiple studies that have investigated the effects of terahertz radiation in all kinds of organisms this is the first kind of study that tackles this issue in seeds in uh, particularly uh, in wheat seeds but in seeds overall but the mechanism is still unknown it's uh, uh, theorized that uh, terahertz radiation may uh, cause a small, uh, very small areas of increased heat, which uh, then may cause some changes. Or it was also theorized that uh, terahertz radiation may 
uh, help at unzipping DNA in certain places by creating small bubbles of sorts, but it's not clear in any way how it works. Um, uh, in regards to importance and applications of this study, um, the technology could be used to combat droughts and climate change, uh, droughts and climate changes effects on crops because seeds may be exposed for a certain optimal amount of time before being used by farmers, optimal amount of time which would uh, minimize the damage while increasing, uh, while maximizing the uh, growth speed that the seeds would have uh, after exposure. Um, they may also, uh, the technology may also be used for um, accelerating growth in some other plant species, though um, much more research is needed since uh, different species of plants have different metabolisms and different kinds of uh, seeds, so dosage and reaction may differ significant, uh, significantly. Um, Weak points of this uh, study are mainly uh, the mixed data, the uh, small sample size, uh, conditions unfavorable for growing uh, from the beginning of the study, and um, uh, overall more research is needed, particularly on how the mechanism, uh, uh, how uh, what is the mechanism behind how terahertz uh, affects microorganisms and uh, especially uh, seeds. Um, uh, more research is also needed on the effects of uh, on uh, seeds resistance towards drought. Uh, after exposure to terahertz because uh, we have not grown them uh, out in the field but rather in a laboratory with controlled um, uh, with controlled uh, temperature and um, humidity uh, and the best amount of time for minimal damage and maximum growth must be also um, assessed before the seeds can be uh, before the technology can be used on seeds in in an actual uh, useful setting and uh, lastly, um, more research is also needed on mutations because it is, uh, uh, it is very probable that uh, the seeds did suffer some mutations, even if not necessarily on how um, the sequence of nucleotides uh, are, uh, is in, the, in their DNA, but uh, terahertz radiation may have uh, um, turned on or off certain genes in DNA. So the effects on uh, the long term effects on the genetic material of uh, these seeds must be assessed before they can be used. Um, this uh, research is uh, particularly uh, helped by the fact that University of Rochester uh, has uh, managed to generate terahertz radiation from water which would mean that uh, the, the technology could become much more um, easy to use uh, since uh, what I have used was uh, were some crystals made of, out of titanium and sapphire. So uh, that is prohibitive in, the, uh, in how the technology could be used on a large scale. But if, uh, um, if terahertz can be uh, created from liquid water, then uh, the technology may only have to um, to overcome the issues regarding those stated before, regarding the mechanism of action and so on, before it can actually be used uh, on a much larger scale. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this was all. Okay. Any questions? I have a question to you. I would like to know if you know that uh, in Bucharest, in Megureli platform, there are such uh, Erasmus laboratory. Um, is a gamma radiation of different objects. Yeah, I'm afraid that uh, gamma radiation is a type of radiation that is uh, very different from terahertz in the sense that uh, uh, it's mm, ionizing and it's damaging while terahertz is quite on yeah. the other side. On yes, it is, it is very different, uh, but I, I would like to, to, to know if you compare, for example, the effect of gamma radiation and effect of terahertz radiation because 
both has positive and both has negative peculiarity and moments. And uh, both uh, may be stimulated or inhibit different process in the study materials. Depend on the, for example, the um, frequency, depend on the uh, time of the radiation, and depend on the object. For yeah, so, um, yeah, in a way, in, in this sense, it's uh, very similar to how, um, to the effects that uh, gamma rays have on biological organisms. Though I'm thinking that terahertz radiation has a much more uh, mild and uh, nature in the sense of how it can be used, in the sense that is, it is not as dangerous as uh, gamma rays. Uh, for example, terahertz, uh, mm, a large dosage of terahertz may at the very most um, cause some leaky membranes and some protein unfolding, but nothing too uh, terrible to cause lasting damage in the way that gamma rays do. So I'm thinking that um, uh, they are usable in a much more controlled manner than uh, gamma rays could. Gamma rays are like, uh, if, if I were to describe them, their effects on biological organisms, like a tank that just goes through everything and does not care for what happens. But uh, with terahertz radiation, I'm thinking that's more of a soldier that knows where to shoot and where to go and how to properly assess the situation. And uh, to Magurele, I'm not sure if they have terahertz radiation. It would be very interesting to work with them and find out, but uh, I'm, I'm, I, I have no idea. Thank you. Thank you for that. You see the title? Uh, the previous uh, reporters spoke about different threats. I also uh, will speak about uh, microbiological contamination, but uh, we offer some uh, possibilities of uh, fighting with contamination. You see the motto, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. Different senses of this uh, uh, expression of uh, Albert Einstein. Of course, uh, moving, we understand not only mechanical moving, but uh, progressive growth of free energy accumulated. Later on, uh, we'll speak about free energy. Uh, and uh, also, it is about our immune system, which must move, should permanently be mobilized and react on the threats. You see the uh, picture, uh, which is uh, uh, actual state of uh, coronavirus propagation in the world. And uh, we should mention that microbiological decontamination is a challenging problem for Homo urbanus civilization. Many factors indicate the evident exacerbation of this problem. Continuous population growth combined with the increasing degree of its urbanization and mobility, intensification of the anthropogenic uh, pressure upon the environment, amplified by periodical natural disasters and different scale technologic catastrophes. Also eventual biological terrorism threats should be taken into account. We can uh, mention that COVID-19 is not the first contamination and probably is not the ultimate challenge. The fighting last 
according to epidemiological criteria, the formation of a separate focus into a terrifying pandemic was facil facilitated, in our op opinion, not only by underestimation of the virulence of the fresh coronavirus, but also the interpretation of this coronavirus infection mainly as a disease of dirty hands or the result of direct contact. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I am uh, disturbed uh, because of uh, uh, because I cannot uh, show the uh, presentation uh, in a traditional mode. Accordingly, the main tools for preventing the spread of, of infection are personal hygiene, avoiding direct contact, and wearing a mask, as well as spraying liquid disinfectants. We consider that that is not that is not sufficient it could be sufficient for the first stage of infection propagation when preventive measures large scale testing in risk groups adequate quarantine measures vaccination and so on also, timely identification of foci of infection at early staging, stages, which enables doctors and other government agencies to track individual infections and eliminate the chain of infection. Coronavirus infection rate in this case is smaller than one. It means that uh, there is a sufficient control under the propagation of infection, this first point. But it happens frequently that high levels of infection exceed the ability of the medical system to control the, the epidemic, and the epidemic is growing and coronavirus infection rate is larger than one. <clears throat> From above comes important conclusion. Epidemiological situation cannot be controlled without efficient, efficient in optimal way, decontamination of air and surface. So not only Hygiene, not only uh, the control of uh, uh, dirty hands, but we should have an optimal, efficient control of decontamination of air and surface. So it is the subject of our presentation. One example which happened. Uh, uh, recently, uh, a flight from from one country, which suspended, was suspended several times by Chinese aviation regulator for carrying uh, COVID-19 patient, was identified as a source of a latest outbreak. Airport cleaning staff were infected by cleaning the airplane's cabin. You see that uh, this cleaning was uh, several hours after uh, the aircraft arriving in the airport and no contact could be without passengers. But infection took place. So the decontamination of air and surfaces is very important. 
one work of uh, uh, from Norwegia, Norway, uh, from Oslo, which uh, confirms, in fact, that uh, the contamination of air and uh, surfaces is uh, a challenge. Uh, they, uh, uh, the authors, uh, uh, investigated the influence of precipitations on uh, coronavirus uh, propagation, and they found that precipitation are strangers for COVID, but the uh, sun and uh, uh, warm temperatures are soulmates for COVID-19. For COVID it's an important conclusion. We uh, confirmed this conclusion with uh, observation of the situation for Republic of Moldova in period in period uh, April May uh, of this year. What happened at the beginning of April? We had more than two two thousand uh, infections per day. And after two months, it was about 100, about 100 infections. So it means that uh, something happened. Uh, are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Yes, but uh, Mr. Bosniaga, I would like to remember to you that you have uh, 45 slides. Please concentrate on the main uh, results because uh, the time passed very quickly. And yes. uh, you have only 15 minutes for presentation with questions together. Okay. So the, uh, this uh, happened because we have the precipitations, the rains, uh, which have a drizzling character and they contributed to the purification of air from the dispersed contaminants. If you are not sure that rains contribute to the to the uh, decontamination of air. You can see the statistics of more than 1 billion from India. This period corresponds to the rains. And you can see how, how uh, was uh, the reduced the daily case. So, Uh, you are convinced probably that uh, we shall have the instrument for decontamination of air and uh, uh, and surfaces. Antibiotics are not the solution. I uh, pass uh, to another. Uh, light. And uh, and pass to the optimization of the thermodynamic approach for sterilization problem. It is important to optimize because, because of the uh, importance and uh, such measures should be 
sufficiently economically uh, funded. Traditional methods do not ensure uh, protection from coronavirus propagation. Uh, we uh, propose thermodynamic method for optimization of uh, uh, the contamination process. Um, all organisms need permanent supply of free energy. This is a condition of life. And if we reduce the free energy, it means that we kill the organism. So this reduction is the goal of our methods to reduce the free energy of the formation. I don't uh, speak about organism only because virus are non-cellular uh, formation. Uh, I follow your uh, uh, opinion that I should be faster. The conclusion is that we shall reduce the free energy of the formation. How we can reduce? We can reduce by chemical, spontaneous, exothermic, irreversible reactions of oxidation. So oxidation is the possibility to obtain the best solution, the optimal solution for decontamination. Uh, what should be the oxidant? Oxidant oxygen, oxygen is the most indicated oxidizer. You can see it from this table. Uh, of course, uh, fluorine is uh, more uh, uh, strong oxidizer, but it is not. Uh, possible to, to use fluorine because of the ecological problem. So oxygen atoms should be used for oxidizing. We consider that cold non-equilibrium plasma, chemical reaction of oxidation in oxygen atmosphere is the best and energy efficient method for irreversible sterilization. How can we obtain such a plasma? Uh, I will uh, pass through the discussion of the ultraviolet. Uh, ultraviolet is not the optimal solution for uh, for this problem. Japanese uh, investigation of uh, the uh, macro of the bacteria placed on the exterior exterior uh, surface of uh, the International Space uh, Station dry bacteria survived three years, three years uh, ultraviolet, inclusively extreme range of uh, ultraviolet. So ultraviolet is not a solution. The solution is uh, oxidation by atomic oxygen. How to obtain this oxygen? It is obtained in uh, the best method is microwave plasma.
So microwaves are the best method to generate cold non-equilibrium plasma, uh, which generates atomic oxygen and consequently a zone, which is a result of uh, Here you see the explanation why microwaves microwaves are uh, useful. Please because take your we, present your conclusion, Mr. Bosniaga, please, because time is passed. The time passed. Okay, so you see that microwaves ensure non-equilibrium plasma. The gas temperature is low, and electrons which cause ionization and respectively the uh, dissociation of the oxygen and other components is important. Here you see the oxygen plasma, how it is looking. Uh, I omit uh, another possibility of use uh, of high voltage and also I omit the use of radionuclides, uh, which are used for uh, maintaining of non-self-sustaining discharge in microwave oven. And the conclusions. Nowadays, non semicold oxygen plasma could be considered functional energetic and ecologically as the most efficient tool for pathogenic microflora inactivation. Cold plasma provides energy efficient generation of oxidative reactive forms, atomic oxygen, ozone, hydroxyl radical, hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, and singlet oxygen. For remote objects, a zone generated and cold generated plasma ensures efficient decontamination. So, the solution for uh, decontamination of air and uh, surfaces is the generation of a zone in microwave plasma, oxygen plasma. This is our uh, solution for uh, to fight against the uh, coronavirus. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, we have uh, time for implementation of this method, but uh, we uh, proved that it is the optimum. Questions, please. Thank you. Any questions? May I ask a question? Uh, uh, maybe I missed some points uh, um, uh, while presentation, but I want to ask you, uh, what is the uh, range of temperature of the so-called so -called, uh, cold plasma? It is very different. Of course, uh, it is uh, incomparably smaller than uh, uh, plasma, which we uh, than uh, which we call plasma. It is called plasma. Uh, we uh, can vary. We can vary this temperature uh, from. Uh, uh, room temperature up to 300 uh, degrees. From this is the, the range. This is the range. But you can uh, cool the oxygen which you uh, you are uh, uh, ionized. Previously, if you 
school, you can obtain small end. Up to cryogenic oxygen. So the temperature can be what you want to, to have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all participants for uh, presentation for and for uh, interesting questions.